In one of his sermons, R.C. Sproul said words to the following effect. Somebody came to Jesus with a fascinating question. And before I repeat this question, I want you to ask yourself, how would I answer this question? The person comes to Jesus and says, Lord, will those who are saved be few? Have you ever wondered about that? Will the majority of people who are alive today go to heaven or will they go to hell? What if you go to funeral services of your friends and acquaintances who die? The answer you can give to that question is obviously an overwhelming number will go to heaven. Hell must be reserved for people like Hitler, Stalin, and those guilty of the worst kind of atrocities against humanity. So back to our question, Lord, will those who are saved be few? He said, strive to enter by the narrow gate. Now there is a parallel passage which Jesus gave on the Sermon of the Mount where he says similarly, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy. That leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the way is narrow, and the way is hard, that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So here's what Jesus is saying, that most, if not the majority, of human beings that you know and that I know are on their way to hell, and if they were to die tonight, they would go to hell. And it also says to me, statistically, that there's a significant number of people in this room right now who, if they die tonight, would wake up in hell because they're on the broad road. They think they can get through the narrow gate by living on Broadway. Here's the problem. It gets worse. Jesus says, When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us. They don't just say, whoever's in there, please open to us. They say, Lord, open the door. In Matthew's version, he says, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? And didn't we do that in your name? But Jesus will say, who are you? Please leave, you workers of iniquity. You are not known by me in a redemptive way. It's too late. Now, I can remember walking down the hall in a house in Pennsylvania, and there was a mirror on the wall. As I walked past the mirror, I caught a reflection of myself, and a thought struck me. What if you are deceiving yourself about the state of your soul? What if you are going to hell? And I was terrified. When Jesus says, I do not know you, some will say, you trod in our streets. I was there when you came to our village and healed the paralytic. I saw that. I was at the wedding feast at Canaan. I saw you turn water into wine. I've seen many things of mercy and grace that you have done. But Jesus will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Now he then describes the nature of the place where they are going and the human response of being in hell. Have you ever wondered what people are doing who are in hell? Jesus doesn't describe everything in terms of the activity, but he does describe two responses of humans who have been consigned there. And he says in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Some people, when they wake up in hell, will be devastated and they won't find enough water in their eyes to satisfy their need to weep. But then the other group that will be there, they won't be weeping a bit. They'll be gnashing their teeth which is a biblical metaphor for human fury. The anger of the damned will know no bounds. And so from everything we've heard, my message to you is this. There are people who will look like they are in the church. They will look like they love the Lord, but looks is as far as it goes. There's no substance to them, no real conviction to repent and live their lives for God. So my message to you, is that you should make sure that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't be caught up on whether you look good or holy to other people. Instead, be caught up in really living for God. A few years ago, I did some volunteer work as a therapist at my local hospital. 
I was allowed to encourage and offer Christian faith-based support to all those who sought after it. I met one man who left an impression on me because his story is nothing short of miraculous. He was fit and healthy and worked in construction. One day out of the blue, he started to experience dizzy spells and heavy bouts of fatigue. Over the course of a few months, going to see different doctors, he was diagnosed with cancer, and the doctor said it was 50-50 for him to survive. To make a long story short, I struck a friendship with this man during his diagnosis, and we would often talk about faith and life after death and God. He came to Christ in December 2015, and he was declared cancer-free in May 2016, five months later. Now from his own mouth, he said to me, I believe God allowed me to face the reality of death through this illness because he knew that was the only way to get my attention. You see, after this man was declared cancer-free, he believed from the bottom of his heart that God healed him so that he could testify to others. A new normal was created for this man. Since his healing, he has brought many of the people he works with to Christ because they saw the change. They saw the difference, the new normal. Where he was once a womanizer, he became wholly committed to his wife. Where he once spoke using profanity, he now spoke differently. He now spoke about God and offered encouragement to those around him. Where he was once a tough guy, he was now filled with love. He greeted his colleagues and friends with warmth. Now, if you ask why God healed him, I do not know. And if you ask why God doesn't heal others, I don't know. All I know is that God is in control and ultimately, he sees the bigger picture. And the bigger picture for this man was a radically changed life. Now, perhaps you're going through something that has left you feeling as though the events you're facing can't possibly be in God's will for your life. But let me submit to you that it isn't necessary for you to go through this situation in order for God to create a new normal in your life. Some of you wouldn't have a prayer life if God never gave you a problem that brought you to your knees. Some of you wouldn't be so kind if God never allowed you to experience the cold and harsh treatment from those closest to you. And I dare say that some of you wouldn't have known the real love of God or the comfort of the Holy Spirit if it wasn't for the fact that family and friends abandon you in your hour of need. In every walk of life, there are instances throughout history where warnings have been given, but they have not been heeded. Before the 2008 global financial crisis, there were warning signs that the banking sector could not continue operating in the manner it had been without any consequence. Loans were being given to people who obviously wouldn't be able to pay them back and eventually, the economy collapsed. Warnings were not heeded. The Titanic, dubbed the unsinkable ship, on April 15, 1912, the unthinkable happened when the Titanic collided with an iceberg. And you know, the thing about icebergs is that there is more than what meets the eye. Up to nine-tenths of a berg is hidden below the surface, and for the Titanic, that's where the damage happened below the surface. Now, it's widely reported that the Titanic received multiple warnings before it collided with the iceberg. Some historians have even reported that the Titanic received as many as five warnings from nearby ships telling them that icebergs lay ahead. Once again, warnings were not heeded. These are two historical events where warnings were not acted upon. And somewhere in the world, someone is being warned about their health. If they continue eating what they're eating, if they continue being inactive and not exercising, then there will be health consequences. In every walk of life, there are warnings. In the workplace, someone in the world is being warned about their behavior, their productivity, or their punctuality. In society, someone is being warned not to speed while driving. We have warnings everywhere. But you see, today, I want to talk to you about five warnings in the Bible that most of us don't take seriously enough, but we should. Now, this first warning is hard-hitting. It's uncomfortable for the majority of people, but nonetheless, it is necessary because it is real. This is the unmissable appointment. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, 
and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. The Bible warns us that everyone has two appointments they must attend, their death and then their judgment. We will be judged by the Lord one day. Matthew 12, verse 36 is very direct regarding this. The Bible reads, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. We will stand in front of God one day when this life is over. We don't like to think about it, but the Bible talks about it, so we should take heed. One pastor said, Everyone thinks eternity is a long way away, but all you need to do is miss a few heartbeats and you're there. And that's true. The Bible says, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. David said, Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And so, in light of this warning, my message to you today is a reminder that time is precious. Time is fleeting. You only live today. Yesterday is gone and tomorrow is not promised. And so what better time is there than right now to get right with God? What better time is there than right now to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? The second warning is what I call the gateway. Every individual has one area that they must guard closely and ferociously as though their life depends on it, because it does. Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, Above all else, Guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So why is it so important to guard your heart? The plan of the enemy is to attack your heart. It's to infiltrate your heart so that you would be consumed with everything but God. David in Psalm 141 verse 4 prayed and said, Do not let my heart be drawn to what is evil, so that I take part in wicked deeds, along with those who are evildoers. Do not let me eat their delicacies. You see, the heart is an arena. It's the center of everything that a believer needs to guard concerning their lives. It's a battleground where all the fights in your life take place. The fight between good and evil takes place in your heart. The fight between God and earthly idols, that takes place in your heart. The fight to wake up early and pray, stay up late to pray, spend time in the Word. All of these are issues dealt with in the heart. The third warning is all about humility. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says, If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The Amplified Translation puts it this way, Therefore, let the one who thinks he stands firm, immune to temptation, being overconfident and self-righteous, take care that he does not fall into sin and condemnation. So the minute that you think you are strong or you're something or you've achieved greatness, that's actually your most vulnerable moment. And I would even argue that for a Christian, when you reach a place like this where you are in awe of your own accomplishments and your own talent or achievements, this is dangerous because consciously or subconsciously, you will think you don't need God. But the Bible says pride comes before a downfall. He's an opportunist. The minute you're on a high and you're distracted, he'll throw a punch or trip you up. So when the Bible is saying, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall, it's really saying, always be alert, always be on guard. Don't be led by emotions because emotions are deceitful. The fourth warning is what I call the small destroyer, the tongue. Words are a powerful force. Proverbs 6 verse 2 says, you are snared by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. And if you read the book of James, he compares our tongues to a forest fire and the fire of hell. Fire causes damage. Our words can cause damage as well. The words you say can destroy relationships you have built your whole life. Think of all the great accomplishments humanity has made over the past 2,000 years since James wrote this book. We have flown to the moon, created phones that can call people on the other side of the world, and even created moving holograms. However, we have not found a way to control our tongue. The same tongue that we use to praise God, we often use to bring down people. Our words truly matter. Since they hold such weight in both our life and the life of those around us, we should try to control our tongues. 
The final warning is all about your inner circle. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Equally, Proverbs 16 verse 28 tells us that a perverse person stirs up conflict and a gossip separates close friends. Who you keep around will affect you. That's the warning we're given here. There's no two ways about it. Bad friends, friends who aren't saved, friends or people who are not in Christ, will ruin you spiritually. But this is not to say you cannot have any interactions with unbelievers, but it is to say be careful who you let in and around you because if you allow them to get close enough, bad company will ruin good morals. Bad company will stir up conflict and division, and a gossip will separate close friends. So you've been warned about how you should deal with those around you. You've been warned that regardless of how good you think you are, you're at risk of being corrupted. Should you choose to keep bad company around? Should you choose to keep sinful company around? After any significant event in life, things rarely go back to the way they used to be. For example, life changes when you have your first child. You have a precious life that is completely dependent on you to meet their wants and needs. A child creates a new normal. When parents grow old, life changes. They become more dependent on you. Or, at the very least, you become more worried and concerned about them. Are they okay? Are they careful when the weather outside is cold and icy? Did they fall? Why aren't they picking up the phone? When was their last checkup? For anyone with elderly parents, at some point, there is a new normal when it comes to your family dynamics. Look throughout history. The Great Depression, which began in the United States in 1929 and spread worldwide, was the longest and most severe economic downturn in modern history. It was marked by steep declines in industrial production and in prices, deflation, mass unemployment, banking panics, and sharp increases in rates of poverty and homelessness. It is well documented that the Great Depression created a new normal for families and the wider society. One article reads as follows. Households embraced a new level of frugality in daily life. They kept kitchen gardens, patched worn-out clothes, and passed on trips to the movies as they privately struggled to retain ownership of a home or automobile. Many families strived for self-sufficiency by keeping small kitchen gardens with vegetables and herbs. Some towns and cities allowed for the conversion of vacant lots into community thrift gardens, where residents could grow food. So you see, a devastating change in the economy caused a new normal for the entire population. But what has that got to do with us as believers in Christ? Well, before I get into talking about how God can and often does create a new normal for us, I really want to paint this picture to you that life is all about adapting. Change comes to everyone. Whether you like it or not, change comes and creates a new normal in people's lives. Now, I want you to know these two things. God can allow something to happen in your life that will lead to a new normal for you. Or, sin can be the cause of something that leads to a new normal in your life. And the thing is, when God allows change in your life, there is always a purpose. There is always a good work being done. However, when sin causes change in your life, it's more often than not a consequence. So to summarize, dear listener, I want you to know that on the other side of the challenge you're facing, God will create a new normal for you. On the other side of your pain, God has prepared a new normal for you. Keep believing and keep trusting in Him. In Acts 17, verse 30 to 31, the Bible says, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Paul here is preaching to a very educated group of Greek philosophers. Many of them would have been some of the top scholars in Athens. However, 
No matter their background, Paul tells them they will one day stand before God to be judged. The same is true for us today. We will stand before God and be judged for our sin, no matter our background. You may be a top biblical scholar, an actor, a sweet old grandma, or anything in between, but there is no avoiding the fact that you and I will have to stand before God and give an account for your life. It also doesn't matter who you know. Your parents will not be able to stand with you before God that day. You will not be able to make the excuse that your enemy hurt you and say something like, God so-and-so wronged me and that's why I sinned. You will not even be able to stand there with your spouse or kids. God will judge each of us on our own. The truth is that if you don't repent, you carry no one else's sin but your own. You will answer for no one else's actions but yours. You will answer to God about your life, your deeds, and no one else's. And if you really think of it, there is no one without sin among us. And God is holy and cannot accept sin in His presence. But oh, how we should rejoice and be glad that God made a way for us to be saved. He sent Jesus to be our representative. Where our nature is sinful, which leads to sinful actions, Jesus' nature is perfect, which leads to perfect actions. He never sinned, but was punished as if He did. While on the cross, He took the judgment we deserve on Judgment Day in our place. He satisfied the wrath of God. Imagine you're in a courtroom and put on trial for the worst of crimes. You lay out your case on why you should not be punished. However, the judge isn't buying it, and honestly, neither are you. He picks up his gavel and sentences you to life in prison. Matter of fact, he sentences you to death row. The bailiff comes to put shackles on you to take you away. As soon as he starts to cuff your feet, a man from the crowd steps forward. You barely know him. It ends up that he is the father of one of the people you killed. He states that he did not take part in your murdering spree. However, he is willing to take the punishment for you. He allows the bailiff to carry him out of the courtroom. Later that day, he is killed on death row on your behalf. You get to walk out of the courtroom scotch-free. This is precisely what Jesus did for you and I. He was willing to die in our place for our sins, so that on Judgment Day, we plead the life of Jesus instead of our own. For those who, by grace through faith, trust in Jesus, they will be able to be judged as not guilty on that day. Think back to the courtroom illustration. How would you feel when you walk out of that courtroom not guilty when you should be condemned? You would be overjoyed because you just received a free life. The rest of your life would be lived devoted to the man who died in your place. The same is true for Christians. Once you realize that Jesus took your place, you live a life devoted to Him. That is why we should repent. That's why we should turn away from sin out of joy for the love we received. And if I may say, if you are not filled with joy that leads to repentance, then you may not have really realized what Jesus has done for you on the cross. It's not that you're not trying hard enough or being good enough to receive forgiveness. It's that you don't realize how great God's love is in forgiving you, so you don't have true repentance. Take time to imagine yourself in front of God on Judgment Day. Remember, it will simply be you answering for yourself. As you stand before God seated on His throne, He lays out your sin. You're guilty of lying, stealing, hating, murder in your heart, adultery in your heart, and a list that goes on a mile long. What are you going to say? You can try to lay out a list of good things you've done, but that does not erase your sin. You can try to bring help in to defend you, such as a parent or a friend, but nobody is in that room but you and God. You can even lay out your church attendance record, but that does not clean the stain of sin. The only way that you can be saved is if, while you are still living, today, while you are still breathing, accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior over your life and repent so that His precious blood can cleanse you. And I'll end with this note. Once you realize the magnitude of Jesus dying on the cross for you, 
it leads to you living a life of repentance here on earth. The Bible has this phrase when referring to sin by saying, the pleasures of sin. Doing what's wrong can deceptively appear rewarding or pleasurable. After all, Satan is walking around like an angel of light. He makes sin attractive, but in the end, sin is deadly and rotten. David prayed that God would help him face this and say no to sin. The Apostle James also said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. In other words, say no to the devil enough times and he will flee. Sin almost always begins in the mind and that is exactly where you should be saying no. So pray that God would give you the grace to say no when the tempter reminds us how delicious his offerings are. Of course, the Apostle Paul says the same thing as King David. Listen to what he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. Paul said, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So I encourage you to walk with God. Walk with well-chosen friends. Don't ever take the first small step to sin. Say no when the devil tries to entice you with the pleasures of sin. And so what are we to do as Christians? We all face this battle, sin or holiness, sin or righteousness, my will or God's will, pride or humility, the broad road or the narrow road. Well, saints, here's what you should know. The Lord is merciful. He is merciful to those who repent. No one is perfect. We all fall short. But here's the sign that you're growing as a Christian. When you struggle with sin, when you get to a point where you find no pleasure in sin, this is a clear sign that your faith is alive. Your heart is not hardened. Because if it were, if you were spiritually dead, you would have no problem sinning. So, I encourage you to rely on the grace of God. Rely on the strength of the Lord to overcome sin. And the first step to overcoming sin is always repentance. From the moment you accept the Lord, from the moment that you ask Jesus Christ to enter your heart, there is an enemy that comes against you an enemy that tries to distract you from realizing the abundant life that God has in store for you. But this is no matter to be afraid of. It's no matter to be afraid of as long as you are aware and guarded against the schemes of the enemy. The devil attacks your mind because your thought life dominates and controls your attitude. It controls how you view things. It controls how you accept things and how you deal with things. Your thought life impacts so much. That's why it's so very important that you keep a careful watch on your thoughts. Because your life cannot become any bigger than your thoughts. As a man thinks, so is he. The mind is the spiritual battleground where the battle is either won or lost. Satan is aware that if he can influence what you think, then he can also influence how you behave and act. That's why the Bible calls us to meditate on the Word of God so that we may be empowered. 
Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 4 says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Regarding this passage of scripture, one commentary reads, Paul writes to those who are saved by faith in Christ. Their goal was to live with an eternal perspective rather than a focus on the rules and regulations of this world. Rather than following a set of rules, Christians are to submit moment by moment to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Paul then explains, while believers are to focus on eternal matters, Christians are to set their minds above, so to speak, because that is where Christ is. Christ is not on earth or in the grave. He is at God's right hand. I would like to encourage you to set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. We are to set our minds and hearts on godly things, heavenly things, things that concern the kingdom of God. Make a conscious decision to win the battle of your mind today. Don't let negative thoughts or ungodly thoughts contaminate you. The scripture tells us to guard our minds because the mind is a doorway and you are the only one who can determine what goes in and what stays. So immerse yourself in God's word so that you can realize who you are in Christ. You are well able and strong in the Lord. Sometimes life can get us sidetracked. Life can keep us intensely busy and sometimes life can result in us becoming distracted on what should be our number one priority, that is Jesus Christ. I believe that when Paul encourages us to set our hearts on things above, that means waking up every day and saying, Lord, I am yours, be praised today. Help me to focus on your word and on your will today. There is a battle for your mind, a battle between good and evil. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 to 5, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And pay attention to the last part of this verse because it says, bringing every thought, every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. When it comes to what goes on between your ears, Remember that the Bible tells you to take every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And allow me to put it a different way. Guard your mind. Guard yourself against everything that can influence your thinking in a negative or worldly way. And this means that there are some people you should not be friends with because they affect your mind. They affect your spirit. There are some books you should not read because they plant seeds of thought that are contrary to God's word. There are some TV shows you shouldn't watch because they fill your mind with unclean images. There are some relationships that are no good for you because they weigh you down and bring strife into your mind. There are even some songs you shouldn't listen to because they pollute your mind. In every department of your life, make sure that you are guarding your mind. Guard it when it comes to what you meditate on. Guard it when it comes to what you dwell on. Let it be God first 
in all that you do. Let it be God always and forever. God first and last. God under my feet. God above my head. God all around me. When it comes to faith in Jesus Christ, there is no such thing as a neutral stance. You cannot have one foot in and one foot out when it comes to the things of God. You can't ever be on the fence when it comes to serving Jesus Christ or not. The Lord doesn't tolerate a lukewarm person. You're either hot for the Lord and burning for him, or you are cold and you reject him. There is no middle ground. The Bible tells us in James 4 verse 8, Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. If we claim to be followers of Christ, we cannot be split down the middle. We need to be all in for God. Then he will draw near to us and supply us with all that we need to live that radical yet rewarding life. Consider Jesus' words in Matthew 6 verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, here's an exercise for you. Replace the word money with anything. You cannot serve God and your career. You cannot serve God and validation from others. You cannot serve God and your addiction. If we're not completely devoted to God, then we are not truly his followers. In some ways, being a half-hearted Christian is even worse than not being one at all. Listen to how strong these words are in Revelation 3, verses 15 and 16. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. If you can truly understand the offer that Jesus is laying before you, you have a choice to make. Give your entire life to him and allow him to transform and bless you. Or you can insist on doing things your way and God can become an afterthought. We have a choice, saints. Surrender or rebel. Bow down to Christ or bow down to the devil. Serve Jesus or serve this world. There is no third option. You are in one camp or the other. You can never be in both camps at the same time. 1 John 2 verse 15 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. This might seem harsh, but what John means here is that our love for the Lord must be so great that we're willing to give up everything for him, even the things we love most. We must count them as loss compared to the treasure that we have in Christ. Would you give up anything for Jesus Christ? I believe that we can all be found guilty of loving the world more than we love God. So often our focus tends to be on earthly things rather than the things of God. The truth is, we can't pursue God half the time and worldly pleasure the other half. We can't be a friend of God and a friend of the world. God deserves our complete and undivided devotion. So what should we do in light of these things? We absolutely need to pursue the things of God. Pursue His presence in your life. Pursue revival in your heart. Don't be double-minded. 
Fix your eyes completely on Jesus and he will help you turn away from every other distraction.